as he progresses in the disease, he has different behavior, which changes any hour of the day and any hour of the evening. So I've been in practice for 36 years. Uh, predominantly, my patient population tends to be an older population. And it became apparent to me that memory difficulties in that population were very prevalent. The resources that we had to evaluate these patients were relatively limited. She was a very organized person, but she would organize and then reorganize and then reorganize. Not, not sure if she encounter because of the changes that are taking place um, within their brains. But we try not to solely focus on disease. We try to focus on the whole person and what the whole person is still capable of doing. The faces and voices of Alzheimer's disease are many. Physicians, researchers, caregivers, resource agencies, and advocates, to name a few. This is Jesse Austin of Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. In this segment of Making Connections, we will become more acquainted with the nature of Alzheimer's disease and meet some of the people who represent millions who are affected by the ailment and who are working to make a change for the better in treating those who live with Alzheimer's. I'm standing outside the Aspirus Clinic in Wausau, Wisconsin. I'm going to be talking to Dr. Rick R. Redding, an internal medicine physician at the Aspirus West Hill Medical Specialist Clinic. He also treats patients as a member of the Aspirus Memory Clinic, which is affiliated with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. This network is the largest and most comprehensive of its kind in the nation and provides access to the latest in dementia research and practice. One of the more common questions I get in my clinic is, does mom or dad have dementia or do they have Alzheimer's disease? And so I explain to people that dementia is really a generic term and it means and there's a number of definitions. The one I particularly like is that dementia is an acquired cognitive impairment that affects the successful performance of activities of daily living, which is a mouthful. But in translation, it means that this is a cognitive impairment that we are not born with. We develop some point in our life and that it affects some of the things that adults should be able to do or have done in the past. Alzheimer's disease is a specific cause of dementia. There are a number of causes of dementia. Alzheimer's disease tends to be the most common one. It is a fatal illness of the brain that affects approximately 10% of people over the age of 65. The disease progresses slowly as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. This process makes it more and more difficult to form new memories. As the disease spreads to different regions of the brain, people with Alzheimer's eventually lose, one by one, their abilities to process language, solve problems and make plans, regulate emotions, make sense of what they see, hear, and smell, remember old and precious memories, and control their balance coordination. In the final stage, Alzheimer's destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart, resulting in death. According to aboutalz.org, the progression of Alzheimer's disease takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. For now, the illness is incurable and no one is immune. According to the Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And of the top 10 disease-related causes of death, Alzheimer's is the only one that cannot be slowed, stopped, or prevented. Today, more than 5 million people in the United States live with Alzheimer's disease, with an estimated 24 million people worldwide. The risk of Alzheimer's increases with each year of age, and with advances in modern medicine, more and more people are living longer and longer lives. As people continue to live longer, Alzheimer's cost will explode upward, 
if nothing is done to stop it. What hope is there for finding a way to stop, or at least slow down, the progression of Alzheimer's disease? We became aware of a program that the University of Wisconsin had set up a number of years ago. Dr. Mark Sager was the pioneer in that. And so we did some research and spent some time in Madison with Dr. Sager and decided to become affiliated and to develop a clinic using the model that he had established. I don't believe there are any other states that have a network of clinics that are uniform, affiliated with the university and with the Alzheimer's Institute in Wisconsin. Uh, we submit data on all the patients that we see to the university. No names, of course, but we send data on testing results, clinical impression, uh, and a lot of just demographics, age, whether they're living in the community, whether they're married, employed, that, that type of thing. So there's an enormous amount of statistical information that develops as a result of 42 clinics sending in data like that. It's provided education to physicians who don't deal with this problem all of the time and provided a resource for patients and families to undergo an evaluation to try to ascertain whether or not they really had a dementia and also the cause of the dementia if possible. Of course, for many people, Alzheimer's is more than just a concept, words, and statistics. These are the loved ones of people living with Alzheimer's, in particular the spouses, who struggle to care for their longtime marital partners, even as these beloved individuals slip away in front of their very eyes. I'm on a journey of watching the progression of Alzheimer's disease. There is one thing about Alzheimer's and that is you never know how long it's really been there. I do believe it was there for a whole lot longer than it appeared to be to me. I blamed it on a whole lot of things. We had happy times. We had children visiting us. We had people living with us, which we always did. That was just part of our life. My husband worked. He worked as a pharmacist. He was a very intelligent man. He loved people. He took care of everybody at work. Um, his customers at work, his patients. I heard from other people that there was something, people at work, that he seemed a little different. They blamed it on his hearing. Yeah. At home, he started getting very angry with me. He can be nice when he goes to bed. He also has sleep problems and doesn't sleep at night. How has it changed me if I don't get any sleep at all because some nights he'll be awake the whole night and then he wants to sleep the whole day. But he's really not a cruel man. He just loves our family and um, has been a very good father and a very good provider and husband. He could and I did the best I could and I'll tell you there's a lot of times that I didn't think I'd make it. But I'm here and I love it and I love him. My wife has Alzheimer's and she's been in the home the last year and a half and uh, it's probably close to 10 years that uh, we began to recognize that it was something more than normal aging. I think confusion partly uh, and not being able to do some things that she'd always been able to do well. There early on, uh, the children were telling me it was Alzheimer's and uh, they said I was in denial. Uh, and to some extent maybe, but the other thing is I wanted to make sure that it wasn't something else in, in the area of dementia. So we went through some brain scans and other testing to make sure there was nothing else that showed up there. So, uh, sleeping was not a problem. And she really wasn't much of a wanderer. Uh, she, uh, maybe a little bit, but you know, so d those two items really helped as far as uh, me providing uh, the care that uh, uh, she needed. Uh, I think as time goes on, the stress builds up. Uh, but, you know, most of it, uh, you know, it, we just kind of, you know, moved along with what we did and uh, 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 went out to eat, you know, and, uh, you know, a fair amount and, you know, and, and gave her what help she needed.
and uh, uh, went to church on a pretty regular basis. And there, towards the end, uh, she that uh, you know that I would hold the the uh, songbook for her and and use my finger to trace you know what we're doing. And she, for a while, she could follow, and then for a while, she couldn't. But she still liked to have me, you know, you know, pay attention to her that way. So you know, a lot of it just you know just 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 adapt really. Uh, uh, some extent, to some extent, I say she took care of for me for a lot of years. I could take care of her for a few she, years. She went into uh, Hilltop July 7th of uh, uh, 2014. Yeah. And the kids had been, that helps too when the children are, you know, uh, encouraging me to do that. Uh, but that was a difficult thing to do. Sure. Yeah. How can we, as a society, help to create an environment in which those with Alzheimer's experience a quality of life that enables them to function to the fullest extent possible? Dr. Susan McFadden is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. She is also a research consultant for the Fox Valley Memory Project a support and advocacy resource that collaborates with other organizations to offer programs and services that improve quality of life for persons with dementia and Alzheimer's, as well as for family care partners and friends. Many individuals with dementia and their care partners say that their friends kind of drift away and that dementia becomes um, a condition of exclusion or isolation. And so I began to think about communities and how communities might um, stay uh, in friendship with people who have dementia. And well, one of the things we like to say about the Fox Valley Memory Project is that um, it is our goal to meet the changing needs of people with dementia uh, across the whole journey of dementia, to means. demonstrate that it is possible to continue to have a sense of meaning and purpose in life, uh, despite the many challenges that dementia brings. We are there for people uh, even before they receive a diagnosis, when they're just worrying about whether uh, their memory uh, challenges are normal for their age. Uh, and so we have programs for those individuals. Um, we have programs for people who have received a diagnosis or perhaps have not, but still are showing signs of various forms of dementia. Uh, we have programs for individuals who are uh, now less comfortable in uh, moving around in the community, um, who may be at home more with a care partner, who could be a spouse, could be an adult child, um, and uh, they may be having more challenges, and so we're trying to serve the individuals who are caring for them in their homes. And finally, um, we have a number of ways of reaching out to people who have had to move into memory care. Uh, certainly that's not all people with dementia, but uh, sometimes people do need that extra level of care, and we don't want to forget about those persons. Uh, they are still part of our community. Wherever they are on this journey of dementia, they still need to have a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. And they still can express love and pleasure and joy. And we just need to find ways of um, uh, enabling them to do that. While we all face the possibility of Alzheimer's disease as we grow older, there are ways that we can lower our risk. Eat a heart-healthy diet, try to reduce stress, and regularly exercise your body and mind. For families who have a loved one who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you do not have to face this crisis alone. Resources are available. First, your doctor can help you to understand the diagnosis, how to treat the symptoms now, and how to reevaluate the illness as time passes. Second, Seek out financial and legal experts who can help you with practical matters such as long-term care insurance, power of attorney, and estate planning. Third, a wide network of resources is available to help with financial, physical, and emotional support. I would really recommend that people call their local 
uh, County Aging and Disability Resource Center, ADRC. It's in the phone book, and every county has one. Uh, and that's where you can get lots of information about what's going on in your specific community uh, to meet the needs of people who have dementia. Now around Wisconsin, there are some ADRCs that have a position called a dementia care specialist. And those individuals are tasked specifically with helping to create a dementia-friendly community. People just tell their story and everybody listens and nobody takes anything out of that room. By telling their stories and sharing resources that they've found. It's often said, you know, the caregiver's got to take care of themselves. And I did, there are support groups around, and I think those are helpful. With the help of others, you can learn more about Alzheimer's, find the proper medical care, join a support group, and get the caregiving help your family needs. Please let your community help as you face this challenge. Reporting from Making Connections, this is Jesse Austin.